Hello and welcome. Bonjour, mes amis. Thank you for joining us for our program online at Mechanics Institute with Marc Petitjean, author of Back to Japan, The Life and Art of Master Kimono Painter, Kinehiko Moriguchi. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to give out a special thanks to Alice McCrum, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris, Sophie Aldrich and Shirley Juster of the Textile Arts Council of the San Francisco Fine Arts Museums, and Terence Galunter of Paris Insider for promoting our program. Also, we are pleased to welcome back well-known Bay Area poet, playwright, and translator, Zach Rogau, who has graciously joined us as an interpreter, and also to translator Cynthia Whitehead, who will be assisting with, trans with interpretation as well. If you're new to Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please visit our website. Also, the library is open five days a week and we are COVID safe. So please come down and join us there as well. After our conversation, we will have a Q&A with you, our audience. And if you'd like to purchase a book back to Japan, please go to alexanderbook.com. Now I'd like to introduce our guest. Marc Petitjean offers an intimate portrait of one of Japan's most iconic artists, master kimono painter and living national treasure, Kunihiko Moriguchi. Moriguchi, known for innovating the craft of Yuzen, the 17th century resist dyeing method through his visionary arrangement of abstracts, abstraction and patterns, understands that the centuries old kimono is not to be just an object to wear, but also a canvas to create on. As Moriguchi stated, we have to answer the challenge of modernity. What is a kimono or what will it become once it ceases to be a thing worn? A petit John who formed a close friendship with Moriguchi while making a documentary film, Trésor Vivant, Living Treasure, is uniquely suited to tell the story of this extraordinary artisan and his creative evolution. Moriguchi's works are also found in museums around the world. And just a little more about uh, Mark. He is a writer, filmmaker, and photographer. Uh, he is also the author of The Heart, Frida Kahlo in Paris. In addition to his film, Living Treasure, he has also produced documentaries, including From Hiroshima to Fukushima on Dr. Shuntaro Hido, who is a survivor of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima, and also Zone Gris uh, on the research he did about the life of his father, Michel Petitjean, who was an amour of Frida Kahlo. So please welcome Marc uh, Petitjean from Paris. Uh, we're so pleased to have you. And I have to say that both this book is just an exquisitely written book and his film is also equally as beautiful. Um, and I do hope that everyone here gets a chance to purchase a book and also to see his film. So Mark, I have to start out with asking you, how did you become so immersed in Japanese culture and also with uh, Kinehiko uh, Moriguchi, Moriguchi. It seems like you've had a long relationship with Japanese culture. Please tell us about that. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's very pleasant to be here with you in San Francisco. Here in Paris, it's very cold. <laughs> and I imagine you have a better weather. <laughs> so in fact, I started to to go to Japan to shoot the film on uh, 
Dr. Hida. And uh, after the film took a long time because it was very complex, I had to, to, I had to found um, archives uh, in, in the States uh, from the different things, it's a long thing to tell. We're not gonna do it now, but at the end, I thought that I, I didn't know, I, I knew nothing, I discovered nothing about Japan because it was only uh, dealing with uh, atomic bomb uh, problems and it's, uh, it's very important, but Japan uh, was not really the, the subject matter of the, my films and my work. <clears throat> so in fact, I, I went to Japan again to, for another film about what is called the fritters they are the, the young, the poor people who are, have no education and uh, they are called um, the employé jetable. Uh, disposable, disposable mm -hmm. um, Employee. employees, yeah. Yeah, because they, they work, you know, one hour here, one hour here, there, and then uh, they, they don't learn anything and they just have not enough money to live. And so, I, a friend of mine said, oh, you should go and see uh, the best friend, my, he's like my brother. He's uh, Koniko Moriguchi, he's uh, living in, in Kyoto. So I said, okay, because this, this, this guy, uh, I call uh, the, 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 the brother of uh, Moriguchi, in fact, was a French person uh, where, uh, when Koniko uh, was in Paris, he met uh, Balthus, the painter, and Balthus went to, to a place because he had no place to go where he stayed for a while. And then this was the house of, uh, of Gaëtan Picon, who was the, the right hand, uh, was at the head of uh, literature and art for uh, 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 André Malraux, who was the Minister de, the Minister de la Culture. And so, and so then he said, uh, the family of uh, Picon said, okay, uh, Moriguchi, you should stay here. He was 20, 22 years old. You can stay here and sleep at the house. And, and then he met uh, Pierre André, who was the friend of uh, and the same age of uh, Moriguchi. And this, this person I was connected with my family, with uh, Pierre André. And so when I met uh, Moriguchi, it was a very close relation because uh, I was very close with, with Pierre André and he was very close with Pierre André. So I met him and he said, okay, uh, we're, we're friends already. And so that's how I started. And just when I met him, I said, this guy is great. I really should make once a film about him. And at once uh, for the first time, then maybe discover the reality of the Japanese culture because uh, the, the poor workers, uh, Hiroshima bomb, it's okay, it's very interesting, but uh, still it's not really uh, what I was interested in in Japan during the first time, because it was really through films that I discovered uh, the country and the food also. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, also, were, were you familiar with um, Kuni's father, Keiko, who, is also, who also became a, a living national treasure? And also, were you familiar at all with the art of Yuzen? No, I, I, I never met uh, Kaku. He, he was dead when I, when I met uh, Kuni. But no, to tell you the truth, I was not really familiar with, uh, with uh, art, what you call artisana. Uh, comment on dit? Artisana. Yeah, the people or the craft? Craft, yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but it was really not what I, I, I made several films on art, but it was uh, Renzo Piano, you know, this kind of uh, uh, César, the, 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 the artist, French artist, but I was not dealing really with the uh, craft uh, thing. For, for me, it was like a minor activity. <laughs> I, I know I was wrong. <laughs> I discovered that making this uh, film and uh, writing the book, but uh, at the time when I met him, it was really his personality that uh, interested me. Yes, um, it, it seems like Kuni had a very, very strong personality. I mean, he, you, in your book, you, you, you describe how he wanted to really escape, you know, his 
very traditional, almost feudalistic family, yeah. uh, with his father being this great Yuzen painter, and that everything in the world of The Apprentice was so regimented. And also, he really had this passion to be his own artist. And so he was passionate about uh, going to Paris to study uh, at the L'Ecole des, des Arts Decoratives. And can you, can you tell us about um, you know, how, how he was able to uh, get to Paris? Yeah, in fact, you know, he, he was, uh, first of all, he was born just uh, during the war. So it was, uh, the, the war was very, after war was a very difficult period for Japanese people. They had no money, it was very heavy. And so he was living in a, in a district of uh, where the, the craft uh, activity was in, uh, in Kyoto, but uh, then it was the feudal, feudal um, uh, practice, you know, a lot of um, assistants were working for nothing. They were sleeping on, on the, the atelier. Uh, and, and, you know, it was really, um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the most, the, they were, when you, the younger who have arrived at the last time was very badly treated compared to the one who was at the head. And so it was like this. And he had like 10 or 20 sometimes assistants. And so Kuni was really shocked that this, uh, these people were not well treated, treated like uh, in the other families of uh, craft uh, painters or whatever. And so he had uh, the idea that his father should change the, the, the way he was doing, but the father was really uh, strict and uh, didn't want to, was not even interested in changing whatever. That's why uh, Kuni decided to, to learn another language to be able to go somewhere and, uh, and, and uh, get, how do you call it? To be able 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 to 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 discover himself and uh, become an artist. Uh, in, uh, in another country, because he thought in, in Japan it was not possible because of his father, the open tradition. Up or develop, open up yes, or develop. Yes, yeah, so to exist for himself, you know, more than in the, in the regiment uh, attitude of, the, of the, this family. And so he went to, to the uh, Institut Francais and he tried to, to learn French and he found a great uh, teacher who really liked him and they helped him to get a grant to go study art uh, in France at the Ecole des Arts Décoratifs. Mm -hmm. And then that's what he did. And it's, it's really uh, changed his life in, in, in a wonderful way. Also because he was, he has such a strong desire to, to discover another, <clears throat> another culture, another language, other people that uh, he really found it. Really. Also, Mark, you know, when it, it, there's a very interesting story about how he first met Balthus, uh, working on that as a almost like a consultant in that exhibition, uh, and then he finally meets Balthus by because Balthus was in charge of installing that exhibition. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell how they met, and and uh, what 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 transpired? Uh, after that first meeting. Yeah, it was the way uh, Kuni tells the story is very funny, you know, because uh, so he was in the Petit Palais uh, in Paris, it's a nice place. <clears throat> and it was uh, an exhibition that uh, André Malraux uh, wanted to, 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 to have. So he asked Balthus to, to go choose uh, pieces of art in Japan, traditional pieces. And so Baltus organized this. And then the, the, the people who were, came from, uh, from museum, Japanese museums who came uh, in the same boat that Kuni uh, to install the exhibition, they couldn't speak French, they, could, they had a very bad uh, feeling <laughs> with the French workers. 
but he couldn't communicate really. And so Cooney, who was speaking French perfectly, he helped them. And then suddenly uh, he saw a guy, you know, uh, with a white pants uh, talking to the, to, to the workers and uh, he was telling them, no, you should put that here. And, uh, and then uh, Kuni saw that and he, he arrived and you know, he was very young, he was 20, 20, 20, I think. And he said, no, sir, it's not possible. You cannot do that in Japan. You cannot, you have to put it at one meter and 20 centimeters, otherwise it doesn't mean a thing. Or I think he was, Baltus wanted to put a lot of things on a wall. And he was not happy with this Kuni. So it's, he explained. And uh, I just said, okay, okay, listen, I go change myself. Let's meet in a restaurant in uh, Saint Germain des Prés. I have to talk to him. And then they became, friends until the, the death of uh, Batus. Really, they, they liked them, each other a lot. And then uh, mm. there is a yeah. following of that, of that story. Also, it, it seems that Balthus really, he embraced Cooney and also in, was able to introduce him to the other artists, uh, Max Ernst and all these various artists that were in Paris at that time, Chagall and uh, the Giacometti brothers. Can you talk about the other artists that he came in, in contact with just in all of these social situations, the parties, the salons, and also through his studies? You know, the key was the, this Gaëtan Picon family because they were connected to, to all the artists and intellectuals in, in France at the moment and in, maybe in the world also. So when he was uh, really uh, put in, the, in contact with all these people, it was uh, easy to, to, to meet uh, whoever was there. And then, so he went to a lot of dinner parties, a lot of um, exhibition opening, uh, a lot of things. And then, but also he was, he was quite shy, he was not uh, jumping to people saying, oh, oh. no, no, he was uh, really observing. It was uh, from what he told me. And uh, also there is uh, this person, uh, Carmen Baron, who, was, uh, who had a, a salon, you know, where people like to, to, to come and visit and meet and talk. All, the, all these artists, they, they probably met them there, you know. So, but what is very strange, in fact, is that this is, he had like two, two, two lives. One was uh, the Ecole des Arts Décoratifs, where he was with people of his age. And then all this, the friends that I met after, they said, oh, he's, a, he's very serious. He's very, he works a lot. Uh, we never go out, nothing. But in fact, he was having a, a double life, spending a lot of time with all these people and having a great life, really, because uh, he went to different places and, uh, and he was open and he was happy. Uh, it was, and in the film, you really see it. Uh, the, his face is so open, so, so, so nice, really. So yes. you can imagine that uh, he, char he charmed everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, he came to Paris at a very, you know, very seminal time in terms of art. Uh, even from the, the beautiful book cover, you can see yeah. uh, the, the when you describe about his, the, the main influence of optical art. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also see that, that influence in, in all the different patterns of, of his work. Can you talk about the art influences, including optical art in his construction uh, of the kimono? Well, I think this is really what was uh, teached at the Ecole des Arts Décoratives at the time. No, it was from the, the Bauhaus to, to the, the optical thing, you know, it was uh, really the, the vocabulary of, the, of the, the designers more and also the graphic designers that they were really into that world. So I think he was into that and, he, and in fact, it was very clever also. I think he had like a intuition that if he goes in this direction, is going to be far from the 
the Japanese uh, cultural tradition. Uh, and that's what he wanted. So for me, it's, it's more that. But after, yeah. when he comes back to, to Japan, we'll talk about this later if you want, but uh, we understand, yeah. we'll understand more about this. Yes, but Choice. what's so amazing is that, you know, um, you know, he was in Paris for three years, but he wanted to stay, but Balthus, really influenced his decision to return to Japan. Um, this was such a turning point in his life. Can you talk about what Balthus had said to him in terms of what he must do for his, for his artistic expression? I was really shocked. <laughs> no, me also, I was really uh, worried in fact, because, uh, so in fact, uh, at the end of the three years, he, he had the, the exam of the, the end of the, the study, and he got a very good, it was very well uh, considered by the teachers and everything. So he could really do whatever he wanted. He could go into uh, any uh, graphic design uh, department uh, office in Paris, uh, even and he could have gone to the Switzerland where these people were very good at this time. Uh, and uh, he had off offers to, to do that, but for to, to stay, in order to stay longer in France, he had to get um, like uh, somebody who could, how do you call it? Parrainer, le, le, être responsable for him. He had to find somebody who would be responsible in France for his, uh, for his, for, for the fact that he would stay, and so oh, he had to, a patron. Yes, and he got to get some money and everything, and he, he, so everybody said, if you know Balthus, go see him because he's going to help you. He's got money, he's got uh, everything. Uh, go see him. So he went to see Balthus, and Balthus said, "No, I know your father. I met him, and I and I think you make." A, great mistake to stay here because you will be a very bad artist if you stay in France. But if you go back to Japan and you go back and, uh, and you follow the, the work of your father, then you will be an incredible artist. Because Balthus also was always, you know, um, into the, the, the classical uh, uh, research uh, on paintings and uh, art. And uh, it was really, um, he was very close to the Japanese way of thinking about you in a way. So right. I, I see that I see that Balthus said, I'm going to just quote here. Uh, he said, Balthus said that Kuni must not stay in Paris. Uh, he was afraid he would get lost in contemporary art and become an eternal student. He had to go home. So uh, that is exactly what he does. He goes back in, in 1966 to yes. Kyoto. Yeah, yeah, but before he goes back, Balthus was very clever because he said, look, you know, Balthus, he, he became uh, the director of the Villa Medicis in Rome, which is uh, the great place where students can uh, be uh, taking in charge uh, to stay uh, a year and study in a beautiful place, yes. castle. And so he said, okay, come and see me in Rome, spend your time, rest, do nothing, just enjoy life, be happy. And then, but staying with Balthus, Balthus continued to influence him, but gently in a, in a very uh, uh, slow, uh, slow way. And also Balthus just married a Japanese woman was almost the same age as uh, Kuni. So it was also easier than for Kuni to, to share some time. And also he understood the, what uh, Batus meant when he told him to go back. That's why he did it. He did it uh, and um, it's the title of the book <laughs> because it's a real story. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Really, I was really shocked at the beginning when he told me that. I said, no, it's not possible. And, you know, at the same time, the mother also of Kuni uh, uh, organized uh, 
a wedding with uh, somebody they met. And so he had to go back also to get married with somebody he never met. <laughs> so it was really very violent because Kuni, I think he had girlfriends here, he was having a good time and, uh, and get, suddenly getting married with somebody he didn't, never met, it was very strange. But he did it. Yeah, so in, this, in the next chapter of his life, um, can you tell us about um, joining, how he joined his father's workshop and, and how he reacted to being in this traditional lifestyle and also that he, would, he was considered to be a successor um, of his father and the, 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 the tension of, of, that, of that new role. Well, when he arrived, first of all, you know, he had a, he knew why his father was so good. You know, it's, it's qualities you cannot uh, learn when you were uh, the age of uh, Kuni. You know, learn how to, to work. You do that when you start at 10, 12, it's okay. And then when you are grown up, you can really uh, go very far in your, your work. So Kuni, thought he was not, he would never be able to do that properly because of that. And then also, as he didn't want, didn't want to do the same thing, to repeat the same thing as his father, he was trying to find his way. But the father was being great because uh, he said, look, you do what you want. Uh, I let you do what you want. I gave you two people that can help you. One for the colors, another for the, for, the, for the whatever, you know. And so, but he was, he was really uh, ashamed of his, what he was doing at the beginning. So he was trying to hide himself <laughs> so people don't see what he was doing. And then, and then after, you know, he was, he was very good at, uh, you know, the, all these lines. You know, he was practicing that in Paris. So one of his friends told me that he put a, a pencil on the on the edge of a piece of wood, and he used to go like that in the morning on the wall. It was trying to 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 trace lines, parallel lines. You know, it's very difficult when you've got one meter of a thing like this. And so it was very very good. Uh, at the practice of drawing uh, uh, regular uh, geometrical line, uh, figures, shapes. So he worked on that on his side. And then, uh, because the father said, listen, I, I'm not, I'm the, I will not teach you. You have to, to learn by watching. This is really, the transmission is like that. So that's what he did. And then uh, I don't know if you want to, if you want me to continue, <laughs> or if you have, want to yes. go to a, another question. Yeah. Well, I was very moved by what what Kako said to Kuni in terms of the importance of innovation. Um, he really gave Kuni some freedom. So I, I think I'll just read this this quote. Yes, it's yes, it's yeah. very nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, because Kuni has this impression of his father that 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 he is this traditionalist. So his father hesitated before replying, have you ever seen the work of my master, Kazon Nakagawa? I was utterly sincere in my support for him while I worked for him. But then when I set up my own, I broke away completely from his style and you must do the same. It's your right and your duty even. So this is, you know, it's it's a complete change uh, of a perspective about his father. That his father really was an innovator, and he he didn't recognize that until his father expressed that to him and giving him his freedom to really be an innovator, and that Yuzem has to evolve. 
Yes, but then it's really what I learned, which is very important for me, uh, making all this, this research with Kuni, is that in fact, uh, tradition, it's not only tradition, tradition has to be, uh, has to move. And so if you don't bring something to the tradition at your time, the tradition dies. And so tradition is not something dead. Usually that's what I used to, to think before. But in fact, each, um, each, at each period, some, somebody has to reactivate uh, the tradition with bring, uh, by bringing new uh, inventions, new propositions. And that's what he did. But he did it in a way that is incredible because, you know, the, the father was doing, uh, you know, very abstract also things with, uh, with the branch, the tree uh, branches or whatever. Beautiful tra traditional um, uh, subject. Um, but Kuni said, I have to, to be very different. And so, as he was in that uh, line, uh, geometrical, uh, problematic, he, he decided to bring it into the kimono. It was very daring. And he succeeded. That's Incredible. But also, you know, no, he had a, the, the thing with, um, with the geometrical thing, shapes, his, his idea was that the kimono was not just a cloth. It was, it became a sculpture when it was worn by, by a woman and the woman was moving with its shapes on her. She became a living sculpture a sculpture that what he tried to bring. Yeah. It's nice. There's, yes, he, there's a wonderful quote that says, you know, that that you know what is the most important part of the kimono? And he said the back. He said when the front is illuminated by the woman's face, expression, no. hair, but it is the back of the kimono that's the most important. Is that something that that is his opinion, or is this something in the tradition of kimono construction and creation? No, I think it's really his opinion. And in fact, he said that at one point that uh, that is something he shared with his father, the, the, the love for women. And in fact, he, it was, they were really both trying to, to, to bring the, the women with, uh, with the pleasure, to the pleasure of uh, wearing and, and be uh, beautiful and happy of it. And so, so they, were, they were working on the same lever for that after, in fact, they just changed the, the shapes. But, you know, also what said uh, Kuni is that uh, he influenced his father. And when he began to, to notice that his father um, was using some of his uh, inventions, he thought, okay, my father agreed on my work and now he, li he likes what I'm doing and it's great. And after <laughs> Kuni also uh, got influence from his father and used uh, some something. And when we were talking, sometimes he, he used to point that. Uh, but it's very nice. This is really, uh, <clears throat> so in, the, in terms of transmission, it's beautiful because really it's an exchange, you know? Yes, yeah, there's, there's so much in this book about the significance of the kimono and also the symbolism of the kimono and um, and and also Kako also considered him to, to be just a craftsman. And mm -hmm. so there's a wonderful conversation between craft and art, mm -hmm. um, tradition and modern expression. And is there something else you want to share about that in terms of Kuni's work and what you discovered? Well, Kuni decided to be an artist. He wanted that, but you know, it's also a different way of thinking from uh, about the cultures, you know, because it's uh, being an artist, it's uh, an individual uh, uh, narcissistic uh, attitude <laughs> compared to the, to, to the, the art in, in, in Japanese uh, culture where art is, uh, it belongs to, to everybody. It's not uh, and somebody 
makes art has to be very uh, uh, discreet in a, and work in a context that is uh, a little uh, difficult. And but also always in relation with people, but uh, an artist uh, in Europe or here in the States, it's uh, somebody who wants to, 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 to promote to completely new uh, ideas, values, or whatever. So uh, the father was not like that, and the father didn't consider himself as an artist. So uh, that's also, and also that's why I think the father was very interested because he had uh, discussions about uh, the work of Kako, but the way uh, Kuni learned it in, uh, in France. So like uh, you study art, you know, you can be critic, you know, this way, the structure is like this, like that. And but the, the father was not at all in that world. He was really doing things, but inspiration, uh, intimate inspiration, but he couldn't talk about it really. So that's, he brought that to, to his father. Yeah. I also want to discuss your, your involvement with the family. First of all, when Cooney and Keiko got married, they were very young. And um, so they, had, they were both joining the family's traditional household uh, at a very young age. And um, if you could talk about his relationship with his wife and also the role of his wife uh, yeah, but the, the, first thing, the first thing I want to say that mm -hmm. uh, in order to, 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 to take, uh, to go into the, the studio of, uh, of his father to work, uh, Kuni has to accept to live there because he could not live somewhere and go every morning work. It's not like this. You, you, it's like say, you, you're, uh, uh, you're engaged, you're... Uh, Okay. To, to it. Yeah. And um, then so. But, but so, I, I don't know if people understood that you were saying you have to live there if you're part of the studio. Everyone lives together in the same building. Yes, yes, yes. You have to do that. And then so, uh, but he just got married with Keiko. And Keiko, uh, you know, she was young. She was, uh, she was completely, she was brought up in, in Tokyo with her father who was a dentist or whatever. And she was really into modern life. And, uh, and so uh, <laughs> going to Kyoto and live in, the, in, in this, the building with the father and all the workers and things and the, and the belle-mère, on appelle ça comment? Belle mère, une belle mère, the oh, godmother. Mother in law, yes. Mother in law, yeah. It was quite heavy. <laughs> and so, and, and in fact, Cooney asked her to make a sacrifice. And she, did, she accepted it. And so she has to wait a long, long time. Because, I mean, the father also was attracted by her somehow. <laughs> and, you know, so it was very complex in, uh, um, in everyday life. But she, she was a great beauty. Uh, yes, she's, yes, she, she's incredible. And I really love her. And she was, uh, and she really helped him to, to, to first of all, to be with uh, in, in this uh, studio. And also, uh, she was uh, very generous, you know, helping uh, the mother, the father, uh, after she got children, but you know, what she said, which is very sad, what uh, Kuni said, which is very sad, he said, you know, my, my mother, I know she, she always uh, gave bath to the, my children. I never, she was not letting me uh, do that. It's, it's terrible. You understand? They follow, they follow <laughs> the, tradi the tradition, the grandmother. I don't know. I don't know yeah. if, it's, if it's the tradition or what, but she was cut from the, you know, capacity of her doing uh, maternal things. Yeah. And so she was very sad of this and Kuni also, but Kuni, you know, he, he's like a soldier. When you are in that situation, you just do it or you quit. So... Um, uh, well, well you, you have the experience of also living with the family and filming the family for, I think it was three months 
And yeah. so it, it seemed like Keiko really took care of you. And she also has a wonderful sense of humor. So you had you got to experience, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this home life. And just tell us about your experience filming uh, with wow. the family. Well, you know, this, this kind of place, it's not the place where you can make film because it's really, uh, there's a room for each thing. You, uh, there is a, you cannot put a tripod because you're going to break the floor. You cannot not move too much because, uh, you know, if you bring dust to the colors and things, you destroy the work. You cannot talk, you cannot, you have to be very discreet, but you're a human being, you know, <laughs> with the equipment. And so, in fact, uh, at the beginning, I said to Kuni, do you think, are you sure that I can come and spend time with you in this house uh, with everybody? And she said, he said, yes, yes, yes. He said, yes, yes, but your wife, Keiko, it's good, you know, maybe it's going to be boring for her. No, 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 I will, I will tell her and she will accept and everything. So she accepted. But after a while, after a month and a half, she was bored. And she was not, what she said to be bored, it was not against me, particularly. It's just the idea that she could not connect with me in a, in a language that we could share. And she was not happy that she couldn't speak French or I couldn't speak Japanese. That's what she said, but I understood more than she said she I was. It was a bit overwhelming to have me around the corner. And sometimes she jokes uh, in the film, you yeah. see that, but yeah. I think it was a bit difficult. But for me also, no, because I had to be very, uh, very silent, very, but, also, the good thing was that sometimes I had to shoot, to film very, very small things when he was uh, tracing lines. Um, and I, I had to go very close, but uh, I had to, to take a long lens. But long lens, when you, you have to be very fixed because otherwise if you move, then it uh, moves a lot. The image is completely out. So as I couldn't, I, I didn't have a tripod at the beginning, so could not even use it. But I was having the, the, the camera on my shoulder. And then finally, I learned how to, to, to stop breathing for a long time. Because when you don't breathe, you don't move. And then and I noticed that he was doing the same when he was tracing lines. And the same, sometimes we were sharing the same, what I call the bubble of, uh, of uh, creation somehow. And we were in the same thing, and we were breathing at the, at the end of this this time. And it was very nice, you know. Very medit, almost like a meditation. Yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, Mark. There's, you know, it. The one of the culminating uh, parts of the book is when you describe um, this exhibition at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Shiga, which is featuring both Kako and Kunihiko. It's, it's so powerful. This is after uh, Kako has passed away. Yes. And they bring together the two living treasures, the, the artwork, the, the kimonos of both father and son. And can you tell us about the significance of the exhibition and, and the impact it had? Well, first of all, it was a celebration. Kuni wanted to celebrate his father. That's why the, the I think maybe the, the exhibition was organized before uh, Kako died, but uh, was planned before, but then he had to put it on and uh, after his death. But uh, so they decided, he decided to have the kimonos of each uh, on, on, on each side of the walls and the you know very big room like uh, you and so they were facing each other like uh, I don't know six meters or seven meters between them but each kimono of uh, Kuni was facing a kimono of uh, his father this is very very nice and so when he when he was like there the, you see that in the film he said uh, oh it's incredible. My father is like a 
big boss and, and I'm like a baby. So I think he, re he really feels it. It's also a little uh, too modest, much too modest, but uh, it's really the feeling he wanted to express that his father was really the great one and he was the, the small son who picked, picked up some of his uh, of the father knowledge. But after, what did you mean about, uh, what did you mean about uh, uh, the, 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 the consequence? Uh, he said, maybe there is a consequence on the, no, and also he said, he said a very nice thing at this exhibition. He said, oh, now, Usually, when there's a game you do when you're a child, you, you took a, a rope and then you, you make a little yogurt thing on each side and you can talk to each other. And then he said, it's like one of it, one of them, it, it doesn't work. So I'm with my rope like this and it's uh, sad too. <laughs> because he had the feeling they were connected like this, you know, in, in terms of uh, like physical, um, uh, mechanical <laughs> uh, uh, thread, you know. Uh, right. It's nice also. Yes, they are. They are connected. Mm. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to get some description from you um, about what what is unique about Cooney's art. What did he achieve? He did some beautiful quotes of, about his his working with nature first and then with bringing that into color and form. Um, there's a beautiful quotes of the book and uh, also just a beautiful descriptions about the art of the kimono. But uh, could you just share any other other uh, observations about Kuni's achievement in, in terms of his artistic achievement? Yeah, because for him, when, when he was drawing like this, uh, these shapes, uh, you know, he didn't see that really. Uh, he didn't have this in mind when he was uh, doing this. He had that, uh, for example, he has references of uh, very uh, things from nature, you know, like um, even trees or uh, the, the sand in a, in, in a beach or uh, whatever. And, and it, the inspiration comes from this. And after it becomes a, a rhythm, rhythms of, uh, of colors and things, but he always thinks, you know, for example, there is one, uh, one kimono, uh, which has been inspired by the, by the train, the rapid, uh, the fast train, Iraqi, I think. And it's uh, the first very fast train, high speed train. And so this was the inspiration the idea that the, the speed uh, it would bring the, the idea of speed in the, the structure of the patterns and the colors. And uh, so, you know, it's not uh, really into uh, geometric, like a uh, cold thing. It's really the world gets into these shapes. Yes, it, it, he talks about everything, his work being a distillation, the distillation of, of rain or the yes. distillation of yeah. wind. So he's taking that essence and then finding the color, the form and the color to, to express it. Uh, yes, but it, yes. it, his work is so dramatic. It is so distinct and so dramatic. Mm. Uh, I do hope that we, that we get to share you know some of the images with with our audience uh which means everyone has to buy the book and also can you tell <laughs> us about the film about the film and how it was shown where it was shown and also uh if there's a way for people to see your film well the film uh, in fact i was there at the, when the earthquake happened in uh, 2011 and so we were together with him when he when it happened, and then we said because uh, we were really saw that the, the the nuclear plant will explode, so we were very scared. Everybody was scared, even in Kyoto, and so we planned <laughs> planned to go to south uh, together, 
And, but after a while, he said, no, I cannot uh, leave the people here. I got to stay with them. It's, uh, I'm a Japanese and I need to, to stay with my people. And so we stayed uh, uh, one more week and then we left. That's my daughter wanted to see. <laughs> but uh, no, and so we, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it. Listen, I think we should open up to some of the questions that are in the audience. Um, Pam, do you want to read out a, a question? Okay, we have a, a well, Zach actually posted a question. Um, would you say there is a sense in which Kuni Moriguchi's designs have come full circle? in that the French art that influenced Cooney was also influenced by Le, Le Japonisme and Japanese art. Oh, in French, please. <laughs> uh, Zach, could you... Diriez-vous que l'art de Cooney a dans un sens uh, um, uh, fait un cercle dans le sens que le japonisme a influencé l'art français qui a influencé en son tour l'art de, de Cuny. Ah, ça c'est sûr, c'est une très bonne, très bonne remarque. Je pense que c'est vraiment ça en fait. Et je pense que Balthus, il était euh, peut-être aussi euh, dans, dans cette idée-là, euh, euh, dans une sorte d'intuition à propos de Cuny, euh, c'est possible. So he, he's saying that he, he thinks that it's true that there was a kind of coming full circle in the influence of Japanese art on European art and European art, modern art, and influencing Japanese art. And this was true also in the art of Balthus and part of what Balthus said to Cooney, I think you were saying. Had to, uh, yes, it has to do with it, yes, absolutely. Okay, and there's another question. Um, Maria asks, what kind of resist did he use? Was it molten wax? And uh, Zach, if, if there's a if there's a problem, Zach or okay. Cynthia, I'm sure. Uh, elle, elle demande quelle sorte de d'éléments de, de résistance a-t-il utilisé? Est-ce que c'était du cire um, um, dégelé, dégelé, dit-on? On sait. Comment? Uh, Le cire. Melted, comment dit-on? Ah, oui, oui, mélangé, oui, uh, mélangé. Uh, no, I, 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 I just don't know. I don't know really the, 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 the finest, the fine parts of the techniques. I don't know. Because I, for, it's, it's a long time. Uh, maybe I knew that at once, but I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> well, Susan Selwyn's question is did he also design obi to wear with the kimono no he was not uh, in charge of that he had somebody to do it and uh, he, he, he doesn't do that it's another activity yes you know the what is shown in your movie is the exquisite but also labor intensive process of the resist dye, the yuzen, and all the different steps of creating the kimono from the drawing to the dyeing to the washing, washing the ink and, and cutting at the construction. So does anyone buy the kimonos of Kuni? And yes. also how much do they cost? How much do they cost? If so now, to buy one. now it's pretty rare that people buy them for themselves because it's very expensive. But it's women, for example, who work in, a, in a big companies or become important in a, you know, like boss, they, they want to show their power. And they, now they, sometimes they, they do that, they buy, they, they, they buy them. But in fact, you don't buy them. You, you most of the time you, you, you ask for it. You, you know, if you, so it's going to be more expensive, but it's also the idea that uh, you, you trust the, 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 
the artist, you know, you, you, the, the artist will see what is good for you. <laughs> so it's nice also, but I don't know the really the price, but it's a, it's a, could be very expensive. Of course, when there is gold and things, but it's a, I don't know ten thousand euros maybe. The the, the the smaller. Anna would like As to a, know. I'm sorry. No, and and so and the other thing to 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 help to support the the the, 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 the artistic craftsmen is a. Uh, Museums or foundations, they, they buy uh, kimonos. Anna would like to know the exact title of the film. Uh, Trésor vivant. Trésor vivant. Living treasure. And also, um, Mark. Yes, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Do we have any other questions? Well, Susan Selwyn has um, posted a comment. Traditionally, the resist used for yuzen was made from rice paste, she says. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Um, Mark, in, in, we'd like to also know about your next artistic journey. What is your next project that you're working on currently? Well, it's complete complicated thing, but I can tell you, you know, I have two projects. One is about Frida Kahlo, but it's a film. And it's about because uh, somebody uh, apparently discovered some unknown documents from her, where she apparently, if it's the true material, she mentions my father with drawing representing, representing my father. so. I'm on that, but uh, I don't know enough now to, to tell you more. <laughs> and also I'm writing a book about, uh, in ha about Haiti, because when I was a student uh, of art, I went to Haiti and I studied a group of peasant artists called Saint Soleil. And then now I want to, because I have a lot of documentation that I never used, a lot of pictures that I want to put together, keep that. <laughs> Great. Well, we will look forward to uh, seeing your other works. And what, and what about, are you working on another a book as well? Yes, yeah, also a book on Haiti. In fact, I do, I do the, this, yes. The, 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 the project about the artist peasant is a, a book. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions? I do not see any other questions in the um, or comments in the uh, in the uh, yeah. chat. Okay, well, then I would like to thank Mark Petitjean for joining us for his program. Um, this book, Back to Japan, is published by Other Press. Um, it is exquisitely written. It is an incredible story. It's a it's a beautiful expose about art and. Uh, various artists points of view about art whether it's the tradition traditional expression or the modern expression and uh the tension between the two and how one evolves the other so i'm so pleased to to have this program with you mark and we we look forward to speaking with you again i want to thank zach rogal for uh being available for interpreting as well as cynthia whitehead uh, thank you very much yeah. So we'll uh, we'll say uh, a merci beaucoup and à bientôt.